encourage children to keep asking why, light that spark in them, light that curiosity in a fun way that appeals to them, and just celebrate every mini victory um, on that journey to, to a healthier lifestyle habits. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 140. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Happy Sunday, veggie lovers. Welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I have a plantastic episode for you today with Mr. Sean Conahan, all the way from Ireland. I feel so lucky that I was able to meet Sean virtually during a summit that we did for Planted Fitness Tom Melody. It was really fun, but I got to hear Sean's story and I was just so inspired, so inspired and just in awe. I can't wait for you to learn more about him. But before I tell you more about Sean, I want to remind you that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. If you have concerns about you or your child's eating, nutrition or growth, please consult a health professional. Okay, so Sean Conahan is a teacher. And as a teacher, he believes in the great opportunity of education to empower children and their families to take ownership of their own health and well being. He has developed his own school program called Eat Like a Champion Week, which has received national television coverage, enabling him and his students to deliver their healthy message to hundreds of thousands of households and classrooms in Ireland and in the UK. The school program helps break down the barriers and supports children and families in making a habit of the program's five ingredients for health and happiness, which you're going to hear about what those are later in this episode. He is also the co-founder of Active 8 Camp, who run full-day healthy lifestyle summer camp programs for hundreds of children with a focus on developing healthier lifestyle habits and proudly serves whole food predominant meals every day, as well as a 100% plant-based Wednesdays. Sean is also co-founder of the Donegal Dragons rowing team that has over 70 breast cancer survivors who train twice weekly and compete in national and international dragon boat competition. Wow, so cool. He is currently doing a research master's in nutrition and works closely with doctors and healthcare professionals to provide the most reliable science in nutrition and well-being to the children he teaches. He is an active member of the Plant-Based Healthcare Professional UK and a committee member of the Plant-Based Doctors Ireland. Future plans to further spread his healthy message through school, information evenings, National Healthy Eating Week with a fiber focus, and a free ebook to assist parents and children to start making simple lifestyle improvements. You can find him on Instagram at the active nutrition teacher. So in this episode, we learn about Sean and his plant-based journey and the healthcare in the health journey that he's been through with both of his parents, how he discovered plant-based nutrition, what it's like being plant-based in Ireland, and why he even got the idea to start teaching his students about some of these health principles. We talk more about the Eat Like a Champion Week, and you're also going to get to hear the little news clip that talks about the program that brought tears to my eyes the first time I saw it. It's just so beautiful to hear the children talk about the program. 
We're going to learn his five ingredients for health and happiness, more about the Activate Camp, what he wishes more people knew, and the personal habit he's most proud of. So this is a great episode. I know that you're just going to fall in love with Sean too. And hopefully, if we end up getting to go to the UK this summer, I might get to meet him in person. So if I do, we'll definitely be posting some pictures on social media. So without further ado, I am so excited to bring this episode to you. Please welcome the amazing teacher in Ireland, Sean Conahan. Sean Conahan, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. What a pleasure to have you today. Dr. Yami, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, your work and how you're helping families, just empowering families to healthier and happier um, habits in such a kind and kind of caring way. And I'm just a big fan of your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I mean, I have to admit, I am so inspired by you. So I learned of you and met you on the Planted Fitness Summit with Tom. and. I was just blown away by the work that you're doing in Ireland, which by the way, I'm going to be visiting this summer. If Brilliant. COVID dies, finally, we'll see, hopefully. Before you guys but, <laughs> I hope so. But wow, you are doing amazing work and the work that you're doing with the children there is just so much dedication, so much love, so much passion. But before we talk about this Eat Like a Champion Week and all the other projects you have going on, I want to learn more about you. Tell me about your plant-based journey. How did you even get here and, and doing the things that you're doing? How did you discover it? What was your experience been like? Well, thanks very much, Yami. Um, yeah, I think I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you would have told me 10 years ago that I was going to be eating and living the way I'm eating, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that um, a strong why can overcome any how. And, um, my journey began unknown to myself uh, about 12 or 13 years ago um, when my mom uh, became ill with breast cancer. And unfortunately, um, by the time we discovered the cancer, it had already traveled to the bone. Um, we lost mom 10 years ago, this uh, last year. And um, that was the beginning of me maybe asking why. Was there more we could have done? Uh, did diet play a part? Was it more to do with maybe a bit of stress or um, whatever factors would have contributed. Was it genetics? And it, it was the beginning of me asking why. Um, I grew up on a farm. Uh, my dad, um, doing well, he's 72 years of age and he spends his days um, on the farm. So I grew up um, having a pint of milk with my dinner, um, having lots of eggs, dairy products, I put cheese on absolutely everything, like everything I can imagine, cheese was put on top, um, lots of meat, lots of fish. And um, it was a few years later when, in 2013, um, once again, I find myself asking why. My dad developed um, a very aggressive prostate cancer. And a few years later, he developed um, uh, a 95% blockage to the main artery leading into his heart. And he has since had seven stents. So once again, I'm asking, I'm really asking why now? Because my father, he doesn't drink alcohol. He never smoked. Um, he goes to bed when the sun goes down. He's up before it rises. He has such healthy habits. He's not carrying any excess weight. He walks 10, 15 miles a day cross country uh, uh, for a man in his 70s. So the more I asked why, it just kept leading back to um i kept leading back mostly to diet and also other lifestyle factors but mostly to diet as a farmer especially since my mom passed away um my dad would come in and he there's not enough hours in the day for a farmer as if you know any farmers so he comes in and he's grabbing some apple tart or uh, white bread and jam and butter two two biscuits cup of tea with some milk and out the door again and this happens um, this has happened all the time and it just came to a point. Uh, so thankfully, dad, uh, we acted early with dad. Um, surgery was a success. 
with complications, of course. Uh, I'm sure you know in your work that prevention is much more powerful than cure. Um, he, he's going to have them complications, but thankfully we got there early enough and he's still able to do what he does, uh, what he loves as a farm. So that is what has led me on this journey. Um, what drives me is to, to and I celebrate the legacy of my mother and um, appreciate the people I'm still lucky enough to have around me, my friends, my family. And I want to uh, empower the children I teach and their families and also my family and friends to be the happiest, healthiest version of themselves they can be. And hopefully we can prevent the people we're still lucky enough to have in our lives um, to develop chronic disease in the first place. So that, that is uh, what has led me down this road, Yami. Wow. Well, what a powerful and yet painful journey. I'm so sorry you lost your mom. And I'm sorry that your dad has been through so much. Seven stents is a lot of stents. That's, it is. A lot of, that's a lot of these stented up all over the place in there. So what, how did you learn about plant-based nutrition? Did you find a book or a documentary or, or how did you start learning about diet and all of that? I, I actually don't know how it led to plant-based. I just kept asking why. Um, that was the biggest thing. Um, I eventually, um, after a number of years of reading and in nutrition um, science in general, um, it led me towards Dr. Michael Greger. I'm a huge fan of his work. And I have to say, his book, How Not to Die, was a real game changer for me. It's about five, five, maybe five and a half years since I, I finished the last page of that. And at that point, I just said to myself, right, this is inconvenient for me, uh, for someone who was growing up to eat um, a lot of animal products. This is inconvenient, but I can't unlearn what I've learned and I have to act. I never thought within a year I would be totally whole food plant based. I just said I would take it a day at a time. And I started with one meal and I started with one day. And um, I've delighted to say um, this journey has led me to, I completed the course um, with, I know you're familiar with Dr. Shireen. I completed her course in the University of Winchester. Uh, later this month, I'm starting um, a research master's in nutrition. And my love and passion for health and plant-based eating has taken me to conferences all over the world. That's where I got to hear you speak on the webinar. And I got to London to meet Dr. Michael Greger last two years ago. And I just told him the impact he's had on me and my family's life and that I'm spreading his good work to the children I teach and their families. So um, that I, I have to say, Dr. Michael Greger was probably the, the turning point um, that has, and since then, it's just become more and more clear. That's awesome. And that's definitely one of my favorite books too. I love that book. And I don't know if you've heard the audio book, but Dr. Greger narrates the audio book and it's just such a pleasure to listen to him and it's so funny and it's just such a great book. So I recommend it all the time as well. My next question though, is about your father. So I love how you painted the picture of his life. What a hardworking gentleman on the farm in his 70s, still working hard. I mean, so dedicated to his farm that maybe he's not even putting thought into what he's putting inside his body. You know, just coming in, I'm hungry, just need to grab a bite and keep working. So has he changed his diet now since you've talked to him about what you've learned or has that been a struggle? Um, my family and friends, if, if they ever thought that my father would change his diet, th they would have dropped drop dead in shock like uh for lockdown it was a very special time in lockdown uh the very first lockdown back in march um i went to, because my dad was on um at home i was out of, out of our family i'm a, i have a big family of three brothers and one sister and i was best placed to go home and um help dad because we know he doesn't look after himself food wise so for 11 weeks um dad just He's not a fuss eater. He leaves what's going. So it just happened to be plant-based eating. And after a few days, he started talking about how good he was feeling, how energetic he was feeling, how much better he was sleeping. The first thing I'd done, because I know how much tea he drinks, is I changed him to organic soy milk in his tea. And this is a guy that uh, likes to drink maybe eight or 10 cups of tea a day. So oh I thought that, that would be a brilliant one place to start. 
and obviously his oats, his porridge oats in the morning, I started making them with um, organic soy milk. And not only does he now prefer, um, not not only does he what does he like the taste of the organic soy milk, he prefers it over regular milk, and he's choosing it himself now. Uh, I was delighted because before um, I came down for lockdown, his cholesterol, total cholesterol, which was a nice marker for him to see, his total cholesterol was 5.7. Um, I don't know if that converts to the, the American, uh, but his total cholesterol was 5.7. And by the end of the 10 weeks, it dropped to 4.1, which was a significant drop. He knew he was feeling better, but it was nice to have that stat that backed up that his health markers were going in the right direction. And he loves it. Um, I can't say he's um, he's plant based, but he is. He's definitely eating a lot more plants. Uh, he he has soy milk in his tea. He has uh, porridge each morning. He's a lot more fruit, a lot more vegetables. So I, I can I can safely say he's plant predominant. Wow, what an amazing son you are! That and, and the opportunity that you had that you're like, okay, well, I have this ability to go over there and make a difference. And how lucky you are too that he's not picky or fussy, like you said. That he's like, okay, you make it, I'll eat it. Yeah. <laughs> and that he discovered that it really did have an effect on how he feels because that's what I say over and over and over again. It's nice to have the objective data, like you said, nice to have the cholesterol numbers and other health markers. But really, the most important thing is tuning into how it makes us feel. And a lot of people do report when they start eating food, more plant-based food that aligns with their body better, they have improved well-being, which is something we're going to talk about in a little bit. So thank you so much for sharing that story. I couldn't agree more. You talk so much about intuitive eating. And I think when you tune into how good it makes you feel, I think once people experiment and even go for a week or two weeks, that's the motivation changes then because they, they want that feeling of how good they feel, how energetic they feel how well they've slept and their mood and their energy levels. So I think yes. that's the biggest driver once they can get that kickstart. Yeah, so beautiful. I want to give him a big hug. So please, next time you see him, give him a big hug from Dr. Yami. I will, Yami. So one thing Thank I'm you. curious about is Ireland in general. What is it like? I know that you said earlier that you knew this was going to be inconvenient. You were raised a certain way. You were used to eating a certain way. But is that typical of Ireland? Is Ireland very dairy heavy? You know, a lot of processed foods. Um, is a plant is plant based nutrition something that people talk about there, or is this something that's kind of foreign? So the tide is certainly changing. A lot of people are getting very curious. A lot of people are getting interested. Uh, but we are at, still at the moment swimming against the tide. Um, our industry in Ireland is very much agricultural. Um, I was shocked recently to hear that in Irish agriculture, only 1% is crop-based. The rest is animal product-based. And in a country like Ireland that is so well able to grow a multitude of crops and fruits and vegetables, um, it's, I would love to see more of a change. So what, what that has done is th that industry, as you know, in the United States, that industry is very powerful. And our um, government and national guidelines are still very much influenced by um, the dairy industry, the meat industry. Um, so that was one of my kind of maybe frustrations that I'll come back to later, that that our government guidelines do not do not focus um, uh, solely on health and well-being. Um, the, the industry funding still has a big influence on our guidelines. But um, to go back to your question, people are getting more curious. I think um, uh, uh, it's been amazing over the last few years. You go into a restaurant and you might have been lucky to have one option a few years ago. Now you're having a choice in restaurants. There's a lot of plant-based cafes um, cropping up. There's a lot of plant-based, uh, exclusively plant-based restaurants cropping up. Um, and I think Game Changers two years ago was a big um shift in mindset it, it moved away from um from something that maybe irritated some people to really getting their curiosity and i think um i think the masses are really ask uh, asking questions and getting curious now which is fantastic to see awesome well that's good to hear that at least 
you know, there's some whispers there, there's some change happening. That's incredible that only 1% of the agriculture there is crop based. Sometimes I'm originally from Panama. And sometimes I feel like it's like that too. And Panama is a tropical country that's so fertile, and you can grow so many things. But it's actually very difficult to find good vegetables in Panama, and they're expensive. So dairy, beef, pork, you know, poultry, chicken, that's what a lot of people focus on small farmers and big industries there. And it's just part of that mindset we have that started with the agricultural revolution, you know, that these are the foods that we should be eating that's best for us. And then with we start with that assumption, and then everything else follows. And just like you were saying, you're frustrated with the guidelines, you know, our guidelines are improving. But there's also a lot of frustrations because we start with this premise, this belief, this is best, and then everything is based on that. I think we need to start looking at things with an open mind and questioning Absolutely. everything because that that way we can start breaking down some of these you know, structures we'd, we've had in place for so long because we've assumed it's the best thing. Absolutely. I mean, and like as a farmer's son, like I sympathize that um with the farmers that there's a lot of jobs i completely understand that it's a big industry in ireland but a gradual uh, as long as we head in the right direction a, a gradual shift towards less reliant on the animal products and maybe we start growing our own, a lot more oats a lot more fruits vegetables you know i think when farmers see how profitable it could be especially as spending habits are heading that direction and consumer habits are demanding more plant-based products then hopefully, hopefully the the industry will follow suit and provide more of what the people are demanding. So I think um, the more people, as you're saying, the whispers that are appearing and people are getting curious, the more people start voting at the till and in the sh- shopping centres, the more um, the more farmers will respond. So I think we have all of our responsibility there. Yes, and we innovate. As humans, we innovate. So I hear you because I come from a farming family as well. You may know this. You may remember this, that I said this. My my family in Panama are dairy farmers. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I grew up around that. That was, Our whole family is based on that. And so some people say that if you eat more plant-based, you're taking away jobs. You're hurting people's livelihood. But as humans, we've always innovated. You know, we're not going to keep using typewriters just because someone makes typewriters. We've moved on. We're using computers now. So those typewriter people, they can do computers or they can do something else. And so I think it's not about seeing somebody as good or bad or good or bad industry. It's about what can we do that's better for us as humans, improves our well-being, and how can we help each other find jobs and work and livelihoods that aligns with that. You know, so absolutely and agree with all that. about progress and just adapting for the, you know, for the benefit of all. And I think yeah. farmers included can yes. thrive from a business sense. And as we know, as uh, as my father is proof uh, from a health sense, um, if we head more and more in that direction. I love it. All right. So you are a school teacher. And That's like right. I said at the beginning, I'm just so inspired by the work that you're doing. So let's get talking about that. When and how did you get the idea to start teaching your students about health and well-being? Because these are topics that we just maybe brush over a little bit in school, but you're really emphasizing it. So tell me the story about that. And now for a very important message. Hey, veggie lover, if you are looking for free resources to guide you on your plant-based and healthy living journey, go to dryami.com forward slash free for tons of free downloadable PDFs. Hundreds of people have taken advantage of my tips to help them reduce meat and dairy consumption, navigate eating out, and build satisfying plant-based meals. Download one or download them all. And don't forget to share with friends and family. DrYami.com forward slash free. And now back to the episode. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so passionate about it. As I said, um, the more I learned, I couldn't unlearn what I learned. And I I teach primary school education, so we teach them all subjects. Uh, But for me, it's futile um, to be teaching children about 
what the Greeks ate for breakfast or what the R- Roman army did. If the children aren't are lacking in energy, if they're um, unhappy in themselves, if they're um, if they're not healthy. So I think one of the greatest things uh, we can teach the children for any teacher is how to be he- the healthiest, happiest version of themselves. And for me, I can't have that conversation without looking at nutrition and lifestyle habits. So I was very, I'm very motivated as well. Uh, there's a statistic that 60% of Irish um, Irish people are overweight or obese. And we are now getting 46, just short of 46% of our calories from ultra processed foods. And with that comes the, the, the knock on effect that um, we have 10 times the amount of um, obesity in Ireland that we did four decades ago. And along with that, uh, chronic disease rates are, are escalating through the roof. So as I said, w- w- with the information I've been lucky enough to find and the ex- nutritional experts and all the science that I've learned over the years, um, I had to act and I had to spread that good empowering message to the children and their families. And that is that is what led me for, for a long time. Um, for a few years, I had been inviting the children in early in the morning, uh, an hour earlier, and we would have breakfast together. And they loved that. We would make what I would call pick and mix porridge. Um, I don't know if you what, if you call it pick and mix in America. At the cinema, you know the mixed sweets and you get a bag of sweets in, on the way into the cinema? Well, it's just all the colours of the pick and mix. So we call it pick and mix porridge, but they put all the toppings on their porridge. Um, so they have their porridge and they can put fruits and vegetables and, oh, sorry, fruits and seeds and berries and nut butter and so on. Um, so the children loved that and they loved, what I really noticed was they loved sitting down at a long table and uh, the conversation in the morning, uh, 26 of us sitting down at a big long table, like something from medi- medieval times, having food together. So um, it became very social and they really enjoyed the experience and they, they loved how they felt. So I thought there were so many barriers in the way. Uh, the children were curious. Parents were asking me for breakfast ideas. They were asking me for lunchbox ideas. They were asking me for um, dinner ideas. And uh, I think we underestimate children in this country. I think we underestimate the parents uh, because they really want to do what's best for the children. They really want to. Uh, of course, they want what's best, but they're confused. And of course, they're confused because we're feeding them the wrong information. So uh, part of my job, as I seen it, was to help them unlearn that information and help them learn some new healthier habits and to break down them barriers such as where to find these foods and how to cook them. Uh, so that was a big part of the program was writing up recipes, or writing up uh, choosing meals that we wanted to cook writing up ingredients that we'd go shopping for, actually going shopping together as a class, which was great fun. You can imagine 26 children in a supermarket all at once and everyone running around looking for ingredients. Teach them how to read labels and build it into a very meaningful week where we uh, cooked together, we tidied up together, um, we sat down, had conversations together for breakfast, lunch and dinner for a week, five different meals for breakfast, five different lunches and five different dinner uh, dinners. We also uh, practiced mindfulness and um, did a little bit of de-stressing with a bit of breathing and mindfulness. And we also uh, trained for 30 minutes each day together. So it was a lovely week. And a real highlight for me was like seeing how uh, years later, the children go on to secondary school, but they come back to visit and the habits are still alive and they're still um, eaten healthily as a result. And that was the whole point, that they would feel so good and enjoy the experience, a very positive experience, and that they would carry that forward as a habit. And for me, that was ultimate highlight uh, highlight of, of the Eat Like a Champion program, that they carried some of these habits forward in their life. Wow, that sounds so much fun, so amazing. So do you do this once every school year with each new set of students that you get? And do you do it like at the beginning of the year? Or how do you usually structure this? So the first time I done it was two years ago. Um, and thankfully, uh, RTE, who are a national news broadcaster, um, they came out and recorded it. So the, um, we done that two years ago and we were planning to do something similar last year, only uh, COVID 
uh, mm-hmm. happened, which d- delayed some of our plans. But the one thing I would say um, for your uh, your listeners that are teachers is this was a fin- it was one of the highlights of my teaching career and one of the best things I've done, and it's something that I will be doing. But I also it, it was a lot of work and it was a lot of workload on the teacher, so. I can't expect everyone to be as passionate about this as we are, Yami. And I can't expect all teachers to take on that extra workload. So a lot of things I've been doing is trying to develop resources uh, that I can share with teachers and share with schools that are very manageable and they don't uh, weigh them down and weigh down their workload. Um, so like some, if you'd like, I could share some of the, some of the other um, initiatives I've been running that might be very applicable and very transferable to your teachers who are listening. Um, Absolutely. But first, let me, I want to uh, make space to play that clip now so that my listeners can hear the news story that you played in Ireland. And then after we play the clip, tell me a couple of your favorite stories or highlights that you remember from that first time that you did the program. But first, with the help of their passionate teacher, a group of sixth-class boys are learning about making healthy lifestyle choices. This morning, Killian found out more. These boys are scouring the shelves for healthy ingredients. Their teacher has told them all about which ingredients to look for and what to avoid in certain highly processed foods. After getting stocked up, it was time to take the short trip from Super Value in Northside Shopping Centre back to St. David's Boys National School in Artane. That's because these boys will be preparing their breakfast, lunch, dinner and snacks together for a week. It's a big task and the boys have volunteered to come into school an hour early and leave two hours after school. They cook, eat and tidy up together, focusing on the benefits of working as the community. Their teacher, who has designed the meals in consultation with the doctor, says it's about taking control of their own health, happiness and well-being. They're calling it Eat Like a Champion Week. So I, want to, I want to be healthy and happy and uh, it's really good learning how to, how to read labels and know which is good for you and which is bad for you. Between eating healthy, I've had a good night's sleep all the time since I've been eating healthy. I found that if, like... I burn off energy, but once I burn off that energy, I have way more energy after. They want to show that learning about nutrition is a great way to tackle obesity and make better lifestyle choices. They learn about the science behind choosing a varied diet, all while experiencing foods that they may never have tried before. And it's not just about eating healthily, you also have to remember to keep fit too. Pump those legs, Come on! Come on. Their 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise follows 10 minutes of mindfulness. All week they're making sure to get enough sleep and monitoring the impact all these activities are having on their mood, concentration and energy levels. After a week of that experience, I'm hoping that they will feel great. They'll realise how great they can feel when they're eating healthy foods, when they're exercising regularly, uh, when they're getting their 10 hours sleep a night. And I want, I'm hoping that they will feel really energised and they'll feel great and that they'll bring that forward. Uh, as a habit. The boys at St. David's are already seeing benefits and they hope they can be an inspiration to other children around the country. So that's just so beautiful. The first time I actually was able to see it because of the summit, I it brought tears to my eyes because that's you're right. It's something you. that you said before that I've taught kids classes in the past and I know that children they do want to feel good and they care about their health. They care about these things and they get really into it. So I know as a physician, but also as a cooking class instructor, that this can have such a big impact. So tell us a couple of stories that you remember, something that really brings a smile to your face. Well, there was one um, one moment. Uh, so it, it, I ran the program in January. So the, it's still quite dark in the mornings here. And in order for the children to do the program, uh, they, I, asked, I asked them to volunteer. So uh, because they had to come into school an hour earlier and they were leaving school two hours later, um, they had to volunteer for it. And every, uh, all the children in the class who volunteered got a, got a place in the program. I, I let everyone uh, join us. But I remember on the Friday morning, um, uh, driving up to school that morning and I had messaged our, our school social media group saying that I would be 10 minutes late. 
I just needed to pick up two ingredients for that day's food. And I was driving up and it was still dark that morning. It was a very dark morning. And um, as I drove up, I was like, God, I hope they're still on board. It was day five, the last day. I was hoping. And when I just came around the corner and seen all the heads looking out, sitting there waiting for me, it was still dark outside. And it was just right. This got them out of bed in the dark. It was a cold morning. They were wrapped up like Eskimos. They had hats on and hoods up, but they were all there. They kept showing up. And I said, right, that's really something that it's got them out of bed in a dark, cold morning. And I loved that. But the biggest highlight for me was, as well as that, Yami, was just how much we bonded and the social aspect of it. Um, I kept reminding them. I have a very kind of informal relationship uh, with the, the students in my class. And I said, well, I'm not your mom. I'm not your dad. If you're if we're gonna eat together, we're gonna we're gonna all do it together. So they were washing vegetables and they were chopping and they were tidying up and they loved that. Uh, we talked a lot about how important it is to be part of community and contributing to something uh, as a group. And sitting down every day for breakfast, for our lunch, for our dinner, with no phones, no distractions, no television in the corner. Um, we just had great chats and great laughs. And I feel felt felt we got very close as a group. And even though that group have are heading into the third year of secondary school, they still come back to visit and they still come back to say hello. And as I said earlier, the fact that they're still carrying on a lot of these habits um, and brought them into uh, share them with their family and friends, that to me means the world. Wow, what a special program. And you're such a special teacher. I'm sure they just love you. But these are memories that they made for a lifetime. But like you said before, also habits formed that is going to impact their longevity. I mean, this is powerful stuff. So you gave them a huge gift. So I thank you so much for putting in the time and energy. I know how much time and effort goes into planning these things. And so I, I'm very impressed that you did it, but I'm also very thank grateful. You. So go ahead and tell us about some of these other resources and programs that you have. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now back to the episode. Yeah, so I just felt, as I said, we can't expect um, all teachers and and I wanted to reach out to, you know, to, fa- to, to give a few ideas to families that they can do in their homes or teachers that can do in their school. So one thing that happened um, organically was we started doing lunchbox of the week. So every day I come in, I always bring my lunch up to the classroom before I put it down to the fridge. And I make sure it looks good. Uh, colorful fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lots, um, 
especially if, if I've just made some um, bean burgers, they're like the, the thing that looks amazing that I'm having. I can somehow have a, a burger for my lunch and still be healthy. And um, so what happened was the children then started showing me their lunchbox and they started saying, look, sir, I've, I've changed from white pasta to brown pasta or I've changed from white bread to brown bread. And all of a sudden, it just happened organically where we had lunchbox of the week. And I was having five nominations for lunchbox of the week. And uh, we were sticking that up on our school social media page. Here's our five nominees for lunchbox of the week. And Adam is this week's winner because he has three vegetables and a one whole grain and two fruits in his lunchbox uh, this week. So that was a lovely idea. And again, the workload is back on the children. If we can just light up that spark in them, that curiosity and give them that praise. Um, one thing I'd love to say here, Yami, um, was a very important thing that I learned as teacher. Um, initially, w- when I started on this journey, um, I was maybe looking for perfection. Um, I, I, I wasn't focusing on progress. I was maybe looking, maybe expecting too much of children. And a child might come up and say, look, sir, I've changed from uh, white bread to brown bread. And all I would see would be the ham and the cheese in the middle. And um, so I learned um, it's all about, I was at a conference uh, in London and uh, one of the doctors said, meet, um, meet people where they're at. And I realized that maybe I was expecting too much, especially of children, but also of adults. And now what I've learned is it's all about progress. It's all about meeting people where they're at. So now when that child comes up to me and which they do, and they show me their, um, that they move from white bread to brown bread, I don't even see the ham and the cheese. I give them a high five, get a picture for our social media page, and then I give them a challenge. And I say, well, um, what about, could you add a slice of tomato in there tomorrow? Could you add some lettuce or spinach in there tomorrow? And all of a sudden, it's progress. So um, that is probably the most powerful thing um, that we can do is just celebrate all the progress. Uh, another thing we do, and one of the initiatives, Yami, is uh, Tasted Tuesday. So once a month in my classroom, and regularly throughout the whole school, we have a day called Tasted Tuesday, where children bring in a fruit or vegetable, especially one that they think that other children might have tried before. Now, this was pre-COVID time where we were allowed to walk around and sample other fruits and vegetables. But the children, again, lighten up that spark, that curiosity, and they do all the work. It's, it's giving them the information and lighten the curiosity in them, and then they go and do the work. And I can tell you, they go to great lengths to get unusual fruits or vegetables. There were some fruits, I didn't even know the name of them. They were going to Asian markets. It, it was, um, and they loved it. And they were talking all of a sudden conversation. Oh, that's sour. That's, that's, uh, oh, that's very sweet. That's very crunchy. Oh, I like that raw. I prefer that raw. All of a sudden the conversation is all about curiosity. So that was one, again, uh, lessens the workload in the teacher and makes it very manageable. Uh, one thing we do as well is, Again, the knock-on effect and ripple effect of praise. Um, we have, I encourage children to participate in a Progress Monday. Now, Progress Monday can mean meat-free, it can mean entirely plant-based, or it can mean progress where they just simply add fruits, vegetables, and, or more whole grains into their, their meat dinner. Uh, so I encourage the children to participate in this, whatever they feel they can do. And um, they send me in a selfie of them sitting down to dinner with their families with um, their meat-free dinner or their plant-based dinner. And all of a sudden, uh, we share them in the school social media page. And all of a sudden, that ripple effect, uh, other families are participating. And it's once a week, and it's all very manageable and enjoyable. And the, um, the last thing I, I, I've been doing r- regularly, uh, I have a few plans going forward, which COVID interrupted. Uh, but we, we also encourage them to snack like a champion. Um, so the program was all about eating like a champion, sleeping like a champion, moving like a champion and snacking like a champion. Because I remember when I was their age, I used to finish school at three o'clock and my mother would sometimes get home by four o'clock. And in that hour, I used to have half a packet of digestive biscuits eaten by the time she came home. And um, it's just, so what we do is we gather up um, state funded fruits and vegetables that are left over that come in for the lunches. And we set up a free fruit and veg stall once a week that the children um, on their way out of school pick a piece of fruit or vegetable to snack on on the way home. And we also spread that good um, 
uh, model that behavior to the parents by offering the parents a piece of fruit as well. So it creates a good, they're getting a piece of colorful fruit or vegetable for, for, and they're, uh, for free on their way home and they're less likely to grab the biscuits when they do get home. So um, I, I have a few then, um, if it's okay, uh, a few plans that I hope to implement in the future that I'm hoping to work on now over the next few months. Yeah, um, let me just comment real quick. I mean, these are just brilliant ideas. I And I love the way that you titled Progress Monday, because like you were saying before, you want to be inclusive. You want to help motivate these children, but also show them that they are making progress, that it for some people, it's just little baby steps on their way to the health and well-being that they desire. But I could just see how the kids just get into some of these things because some kids really are very competitive. So they want to <laughs> win that lunchbox challenge. They want to get that selfie in the social media with their you know, progress Monday. And you're right about kids coming home from school. So I was a latchkey kid. We call that latchkey kid here in the United States where you come home by yourself without your parents. And I remember eating so much. And I have now two sons, 11 and almost 16. And that older one comes home. I mean, it's like he hasn't eaten for a year, you know, and it, it's like a vacuum. <laughs> cleaner. Whatever isn't attached gets eaten, you know? So it is yeah. very important to have health promoting foods around because they're so hungry. They've been thinking and learning all day and they do want to get nourishment into their body. So starting with that piece of fruit, vegetable is a really great way to, to help that snacking habit be more health promoting, but yeah, great job with all of these programs. So innovative and really brilliant. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And if you make it easy for people, like, as you say, yeah, your children coming in so hungry uh, after a busy day and they just want to grab, and they'll grab the healthy stuff if it's there. I think if we just yes. put it right in front of them, make it obvious and make it appealing. Yes. No, they've done it. studies on teenagers that for teenagers, there's really just one way that they think about food, convenience. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they're not really thinking so much. They're not weighing the pros and cons. They're just like, what's easy? So we have to do our part as parents, as caregivers to make the health promoting stuff easier for them. Uh, and it doesn't absolutely. mean that they can't eat that other stuff ever, but we can't expect them to come home, empty stomach, ravenous, and prepare themselves something super health promoting. It has to be accessible. It has to be easy. So you're totally right about that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Just make breaking down that barrier, making it convenient for them. That's yes. so true. Yes. All right. Well, tell me about some of the other things you have in the works. Oh, okay, so, uh, and again, this was all, this is uh, born out of, um, you know, the curiosity from parents, friends, family, the amount of people who've asked me, uh, give me a breakfast or give me a, a dinner idea to get me started. And all of a sudden, um, like most people, I'm trying to reduce my screen time. And all of a sudden I found myself, I was on WhatsApp sending recipes and um, typing up individual recipes. So that's where the idea for a free ebook came. And I'm working on that at the moment. And I'm hoping, Yami, you might, you, you might even write a little paragraph. I'm looking for a few doctors to endorse the um, introduction because as much as they they take an interest when the teacher says it. I think it carries much more uh, power when it comes from the doctor because people really look up to doctors, I feel. And um, I would love if you would write just a few words, just talking about the health benefits of eating more fruit and fiber and, and vegetables. Oh, but, absolutely. Um, it would be my pleasure. Thank you so much. And I'm, so the plan is to give them five simple, affordable breakfast ideas, uh, five lunchbox ideas, five family dinner ideas, and then the nice sweet treats and quick, convenient snacks. So there'll be 25 different um, uh, recipes in total that'll just get people started. And what's more, I'll be uh, I'm uh, because it's free and I'm not selling anything. I have no affiliation with anyone, so I'm able to say, well, here this shop sells the cheapest. You can get you can you can get that here. You can get that there. And because I have no affiliation to anyone. It's great. I can just call it, tell them where the cheapest and easiest way to do this thing is. So that is one plan. Um, before COVID, I'd planned to do um, parents information evenings with uh, an amazing local doctor, Dr. Johnny Allman. Um, we were going to do a little bit of a cooking demonstration, give them all a printed out copy of the ebook, which I'm still working on. 
and um, and the doctor was going to talk about some of the health benefits as well. So hopefully we will we hope to do that towards the end of the year uh, if COVID allows. And the last thing is just back to that idea of uh, the heavy workload on teachers and giving them something that they can incorporate easily. I'm hoping to design um, because unlike uh, uh, I know you're familiar with Canada where their their food guidelines very much reflect the science and it's so much uh, more further on than we are in some other countries. Um, as a teacher, I've become frustrated at you know the programs and our healthy food pyramid that's in every school classroom. It's in every uh, doctor's office. It's um, Our food pyramid is a guide to parents and teachers. And I wanted to design a, um, a, a program like Eat Like a Champion Week that they could easily do in their classrooms. And um, I'm designing a, a very simple week, which has a focus each day. On Monday, the focus, yeah, as, uh, as you said, people love a competition. Children are very competitive. So on Monday, you get a, you get a ticket. Um, if you ever bring in a, uh, a fruit in your lunchbox, you get two tickets uh, for an unusual fruit. Uh, on Tuesday, it's uh, vegetable day. On Wednesday, it's um, water as our drink of choice day. So they can bring in naturally flavored water or just regular water. Uh, Thursday, we're going to look at replacing um, animal uh, product meat with beans on that day. So their sandwiches, uh, we'll be encouraging them to have some hummus in the sandwiches. Maybe they'll get a they'll get a ticket for beans on toast in the morning if they send a picture to their teacher, and they'll get another ticket if they send a picture of their dinner that contains beans. And on Friday, we're just going to move the focus to um, shifting from brown uh, white grains to brown grains. So that bread in their sand uh, in their lunchbox, we're hoping that's going to be brown on that Friday. The pasta is going to be brown. The rice is going to be brown, and um, hopefully, it'll over the course of the five days. There'll be a lot of fun and uh, we'll have a leader table in each classroom in the school and there'll be an overall prize for the school based on the, the more tickets you get, the more chances you have of winning the prize. So um, hoping, uh, hoping that will motivate the children. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's a simplified version that shouldn't require too much time and commitment on the part of the teacher, but can spread the message further. You know, because my one of the questions that I have for you is, uh, is there any way that you can make uh, an ebook that gives us all the amount of energy you have? Because you have an incredible <laughs> amount of energy. You are doing so many different things. I'm very impressed with that. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Emmy. You want to tell us a little bit about this Activate Camp? I'm curious about that. Oh yes, uh, and I wasn't expecting that. I, I, I'd seen it. Um, but yeah, Activate Camp is just, it just brings together all the things I'm passionate about, about getting children out in nature, um, getting them eating healthy, uh, getting them playing sport, um, managing stress and uh, spending fun time with their friends. So um, myself and my friend Porik, we run um, a summer camp, during, a summer and ho a school holiday camp. Um, we do for six weeks in the summer. We run at Easter. And it's just from eight in the morning, six in the evening, um, we do all the meals for the children. And I'm so proud to say that they're now 85% plant predominant. Um, so, and we have one day per week, which is completely plant-based. Uh, so the, the focus is very much on colorful fruits and vegetables. And of course, uh, it's practicing all the other healthy lifestyle habits, like um, getting out in nature, spending time with your friends, and just being children, having fun, and helping them to manage stress. Each morning we come in, we do a little bit of five minutes of breathing. Then we get up and do a quick at our assembly each morning. And then they go off with their leaders. And we go on day trips, and we do different sports, and drama, and dancing, and just have fun. But it, it, it's lovely because it allows me to practice everything that I'm passionate about that I think will empower children to make healthy lifestyle choices for themselves. Once they yeah. know how good and how fun it can be, they'll, they'll continue it forward as a habit. I hope. Yeah. I'm going to sign up for that camp because that sounds blissful. That sounds super fun. <laughs> a lot of the parents say they, they would love to jump on. I know. I really say. think they need to have more adult camps. I actually never went to camp as a child because I would spend all my summers in Panama. So I'm not complaining. It was great too. But I never went to camp. Uh, and my kids go to camp now and they have so much fun. Of course, they come back completely covered in dirt 
Like, I think the only <laughs> shower they take is the one that they're required to jump in the lake. Other than that, they don't even <laughs> go into the bathroom. So I don't think their toothbrushes get used or they take a shower, but they have a fantastic time. So <laughs> that's, that's when you know they're enjoying themselves. They cover, <laughs> yeah. come, come back covered in mud. Um, tell me about we your five don't, We don't apologize at all when, uh, to the parents when they come back covered in mud. They were like, that's a sign they had, they had fun. No, that's for that's exactly what I expect. I'm glad when I see him like that because I know that they had a blast. Tell me about your five ingredients for health and happiness. Oh yeah, it's um, so front and center of the classroom. Like our classroom, the, the classroom walls tend to have um, a lot of learning resources. So I've always put this front and center. Just about a few uh, what I call ingredients for health and happiness. And uh, ingredient number one is to eat more uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Uh, it's a lot of children that come into my class, they've never even heard the word legumes. And none of them ever think that these foods are adequate to not only be healthy, but to absolutely thrive. And I remind them that the science is absolutely there. The British, the American, the, the Canadian Dietetic Association all agree on this. So um, that is the first ingredient for health and happiness in our classroom but i think it's very important that i think we would both agree yami that that's a very important part of a health and well-being puzzle and there's also very a lot of other very important parts um ingredient number two is to sleep for seven to nine hours uh, each night if you're an adult so we get them to remind their parents and to sleep from nine to eleven hours each night for the school going children and we uh, there's no point, I, I don't know, giving them that ingredient without then teaching them some of the health benefits. Um, I talked talk to them about professional athletes, um, the kind of things that interest them. I talked to them about how Cristiano Ronaldo has an hour nap in the day. He gets to bed early because the benefit of his exercise, um, the muscle growth comes in his recovery. And his recovery means his rest, his uh, nutrition, and um, how he looks after himself, especially his sleep. Uh, our third ingredient for health and happiness is to move. You don't have to sign up to an expensive gym. You don't have to um, play a particular sport. You just move your body, whatever way is fun, and move it lots throughout the day. Um, I always tell them that outside, once they step outside the door, that's their gym. We, uh, we, when we went training during like a champion week, we went jogging on the footpaths. We went in through the parks. We went using the walls of the school for um, for climbing and just just teaching them that the world is their is their gym and to get outside and get moving. Uh, the fourth ingredient for health and happiness is to be kind to yourself and to others. And I think that's one we all have to work on, um, especially um, us adults. And I think it's very important to teach the children that just to teach them how to look after themselves and become aware of themselves. It's something that we're all working on to unplug and to de-stress. And for some children, that might be going for a walk. It might be um, exercise. It might be having um, having a bath. It might be owning a friend. Um, it might be meditating. It might be saying a prayer. Whatever works for the children, I encourage them to explore what makes them feel better. Because it certainly isn't spending two hours on Netflix. Um, it certainly isn't um, online gaming where they're getting frustrated and so on for hours on end, or just teach them to become aware of themselves in that sense and to become more present, which is something I'm, I'm, I think I'm, we're all working on. And the last ingredient for health and happiness is social connection and just love and social connection, friends and family, and just becoming part of the community and being part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think once they um, uh, experience that, you know, and all these other ingredients, I think they'll find find themselves to be happier and healthier, or, or at least I hope. Yes. Wow. The keys to health, longevity, and well-being. It's basically lifestyle medicine. You are teaching lifestyle medicine to your students. I love it. This is just so fantastic. Do you Thank feel you like, much. do the students, do you feel like over the course of the year that they're with you, do they start internalizing? Do they speak this vocabulary, talking about these different habits of health and happiness? Yeah, because I, cause I'm primary school and I'm with the, the same um, class all day. So um, we, I teach all subjects with them. So 
there's always opportunities to reinforce this. Um, if we're doing history, we sometimes look at the um, the dietary habits of people who thrive. We look at the blue zones. Um, and there's just so many opportunities throughout the school day to reinforce it. When we're doing PE um, or if we've had a school soccer game, I take the school soccer team as well. And um, I'm always telling them uh, afterwards, I'm like, right, boys, tomorrow's big game. I want to make sure you're in bed uh, good and early. You get your oat breakfast or Weetabix breakfast in the morning and you're bringing uh, a good lunch, plenty of water on board and so on like that. So there's constant opportunities to reinforce in a way that means something to them. Like there's no point in me talking to um, to eleven year olds about uh, coronary heart disease and type two diabetes. Like they want to hear, you know, that like like my niece wants to hear that her eyes are bluer or her um, from the blueberry she eats or her hair gets curlier from the broccoli that she eats. Um, you, you know, they want to hear that Cristiano Ronaldo is having hummus as his recovery meal. You know, speaking in their language. So there's so many opportunities. I think it's an incredible opportunity as a, as teachers. Uh, there's so many, like the amount of people who said to me, would you not think about going back to medical school? Would you not think about um, becoming a dietitian? And I said, no, I think I'm more needed in education because we have so many incredible doctors like yourself, uh, Yami, that are, that are, you know, um, doing so much amazing work um, in the community as doctors and dietitians. Um, so I think education is where there's kind of untapped potential to have a huge um, influence, positive influence on families and children and in the community in general. Oh, my gosh. I agree 100 percent. I'm sitting over here on my side being like, man, I should go be a teacher. I mean, you're just <laughs> doing I, I just want to clone you. You know, I mean, this is just such fabulous work. It really is so incredibly important. I mean, you're already seeing the effects of it because you're seeing students come back and visit you and tell you. But but this really is just so powerful. The impact that you're having on these children. It's a gift. It really, really is a gift. I know I keep saying oh, this over so and over again, but I mean, uh, it. this is so. And cool. that is the most pleasing part, seeing them coming back and as they're walking up to you, you, you don't even have to ask them. You know that they're carrying on these habits because they're looking happy. They're oh, looking healthy. Yeah. They've a spring in them step, a spring in their steps, and they love telling you. Guess, guess what I made for dinner last night, or um, guess what I had for lunch today. And uh, you know they love, and it high fives and fist pumps just to celebrate that that progress. That's awesome. Well. Now I know why my hair is so curly, though, because I eat a lot of broccoli. So I think I need to watch. I need to watch my broccoli consumption because I don't know if my hair can get much curlier than it is. <laughs> yeah. a, a few little, uh, a few little small white lies never harm. Yeah, no, I love five year olds on board. <laughs> well, I, I remember on the summer camp we had these little energy balls, and um, we we're trying to get the ch children interested, and um, so we have. Uh, we're talking like the five-year-old, six-year-olds, and we have conversations between the leaders, and we're like, um, "Now make sure them children only have one of them energy, energy balls because if they have two, they'll be able to jump over the wall. We don't want that." And they're like, "Give me two, give me no, 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 no. Only if you promise, though. Only if you promise." So uh, <laughs> I, I think love it. Making it making it fun and making it kind of get the children curious. I think it's yeah, it, it's it, it's something that's uh, important. I love it. What do you wish more people knew? That's a really good question. Um, lots of things. Um, I wish I wish people were more aware that most of our chronic disease could be largely prevented through diet and lifestyle, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. That you know, every step towards that is a step towards lowering your chances of heart disease, which are taking more and more of our loved ones each day and each year. Uh, cancer and type two diabetes. Um, one of the saddest, saddest things uh, I, I, um, I've seen is you know dementia, for people losing loved ones before they're actually gone, and just to know that we have so much more power than than we th than we think. Um, we put an overemphasis on genetics, and we don't put enough emphasis on diet and lifestyle. So I would. I, I wish more people would know that uh, as well, just to become more aware of the environmental, uh, environmental impact of the foods we eat mm -hmm. and that the most effective thing that we can do 
here and now today to um, help our planet to recover from what we're doing to it is to eat more plant-based. Mm-hmm. And again, not all or nothing, but just head that direction. Um, I think the world, I can't remember who said it, Yami, but I remember hearing someone say that, you know, the world needs billions of people doing it imperfectly rather than just uh, millions of people doing it perfectly. So the more people that have plant-based Monday, the less judge, judgmental we are and just encouraging people to keep that progress up. I think the more, um, the more we'll, the more we'll see that progress mm-hmm. and um, the planet maybe begin to heal and recover. And of course, the, the I suppose the last thing I, w- I really hope we take from the last 12 months is just the, the risk for, um, of in, like I come from a farming background, but uh, the risk of intensive factory farming and how much that's a breeding ground for disease to develop. I hope we take the lesson from that and just scale back our, you know, our farming that we're less reliant on this intensive factory farming that's, you know, not only cruel on ourselves, but it's very cruel in the animals and um, very cruel in the environment as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That's that's a lot. There's probably a lot more things, but I suppose them three things that uh, that's, if, um, yeah, such a beautiful message, and I agree a hundred percent. And with the factory farming, it, it is it's just dangerous in so many different ways. But you're right. If we decrease our dependence on those foods, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Yeah. Some people just start decreasing the amount of animal products that they're consuming. It is going to change the system and we're going to have less dependence, less need for factory farms because the reason factory farms exist is because there's an enormous demand, you know, so we can change that as consumers. And I think that's a beautiful message. We're all part of the solution, aren't we? We're all, we are all the answer if we all just take collective responsibility. What personal habit are you most proud of and why? Um, I, I think my personal habit that I'd be most proud of would be um, my ability to ask why. Um, I, as much as all my life, I've grown up on a farm um, and eating animal products, I still had that um, curiosity to ask why. And it's one of the most important things I teach the children in my class is to always ask why. Ask, ask questions and seek answers. And that is because asking why has led me to get into bed a little bit earlier. Let me just say, there's a lot of habits I'm working on. I'm working on spending less time on screens. I'm working at being more present and in the moment. I think a lot of people are. But asking why has is getting me on that road. Asking why has me eaten. I'm very proud that I eat um, uh, an exclusively whole food plant-based diet. And asking why is getting me to bed that hour earlier. And um, it keeps me exercising. It keeps me working on myself, it keeps me reading, it keeps me attending conferences. It gives me the opportunity to meet people like you in webinars where I, that curiosity to learn more leads me to meet uh, great people and learn more from each other. So, yeah, I think asking why is my best habit. I love it. No, that's such a great lifelong habit. And like you said, it's going to keep your brain young forever because you're always going to be curious. You're always going to want to learn more. There's always more to learn. It's never going to end, you know? So I love that. That's beautiful. And I think it's an important message we can uh, give the children as well. In in every, in school, in education, uh, in diet, in lifestyle, just to keep asking why. Yes. Well, Sean, this has been so fabulous. I know that we could talk forever, but please let my listeners know where they can connect with you. Where can they find you, follow you along on your journey? And I know that you're still working on your resources, but for those teachers or other educators out there that want to access your resources, where can they find them? Absolutely. So it's, it's, um, it's attention of opposites. I'm trying to spend less time online, but then last year I sent up because uh, I want to get share the message and share ideas and reach out and uh, with people like, people like you and doctors who are doing a great job. But um, I've got an Instagram page that I set up recently called the Active Nutrition Teacher. So that's the Active Nutrition Teacher. And if anyone would like to get in touch on that, I'm sharing some meal ideas 
simple family recipe ideas, um, sharing some resources, some of the science to do with um, nutrition and lifestyle habits and the benefits, and just a, a simple tips to make them actionable and and um, achievable for all people, um, especially um, children and their families. So if anyone would like to reach out, and again, any resources I have, for example, my display in the classroom with the five ingredients, um, my free ebook, my um, that I'm working on. I promise I get it finished now. During this lockdown, we're, we're in another lockdown now. So uh, my the free ebook, um, any resources I have for the classroom, e- anyone is welcome to them. I don't I don't care if you change the name on them or if you edit them, if you take my name off it. As long as the information is getting out, it's getting shared with children and families. I'm absolutely delighted. And if you reach out to me on Instagram, I'd be happy to share any resources I have that will help you in the classroom or in your families or in your homes. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's so, so generous. Well, if you can leave us with one call to action for the week, what is one thing that we can do this week to empower children to take charge of their health and well-being? I think um, encouraging them to be curious and encouraging them to ask why and getting them curious about foods and really focusing on the progress. It's not all or nothing. Let's celebrate every, every mini victory. Uh, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for progress and we're constantly looking for progress. So just to encourage children to keep asking why, light that spark in them, light that curiosity in a fun way that appeals to them. And just celebrate every mini victory um, on that journey to, to a healthier lifestyle habits. And don't and don't underestimate children. I think uh, children and parents, um, as you would agree, Yami. I I think uh, I think sometimes we underestimate children, but I think if we give them the information, they will respond and they will act in a in a very powerful way. Uh, So beautiful. Thank you for that beautiful call to action. Sean, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all the work that you're doing for how you are touching these children's lives and empowering them for their lifetime. I appreciate you so much. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. (laughs) Thank you, Yami. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.